think that the biggest thing is you know don't suffer in silence and that sounds like a bit of a, a bit of a cliche but um i think uh you know my experience of some of our operational teams in in florence um you know they're all exceptional people they work really really hard they're the, the kind of the the core of the business um and uh and they're really good at finding fixes to problems and uh you know sort of patching holes and so on and um uh, my big sort of like um, edict is always you know, don't make another spreadsheet welcome to secret ops the podcast uncovering the world of operations one episode at a time. I'm your host, Ariana Cofone, and today's guest is Tom Wilshire, Chief Technology Officer at Florence. Now, before Florence, he worked at Amazon. He was also a technology educator. So we really dive into how all of those pieces have helped inform his role as a CTO today. Let's jump in. Tom, welcome to Secret Ops. I am thrilled to have you on the show because I have had the pleasure of personally working with you and knowing how phenomenal you are. Uh, but uh, what I didn't know was that you have a myriad of accomplishments, uh, including <laughs> working for Amazon. I know you as a technology educator. You are currently, though, the chief technology officer at Florence. And that's where I want to begin. Everybody, I think, hears CTO and they're like, whoa, CTO. Um, but we don't really know what you do. <laughs> um, so can you break down what your day looks like, what a CTO typically does, and just unpack it for us? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to, great to be here. Um, so yeah, so for me, CTO, I mean, I think people traditionally think about the role as like, you know, the manager of all the engineers, um, of all the sort of people within your team, um, sitting in a basement, you know, coding away. Um, you know, occasionally maybe they were there from the start and, you know, like, you know, built the company from scratch. Um, but uh, for me, it's like, it's, it's definitely evolved into more of more of that. Now, I, we're at a, a sort of a scale up stage at Florence um, now. And, mm -hmm. and since I joined, it was obviously you know, initially, you know, coding, engineering, a lot of that's like the sort of early stage of any company like growing but um really i think what i see it now it's, it's actually you know how do you know how do i help the, the the team and the company use technology to you know the full extent and that could be everything from yes okay i do manage engineers that's like a key part of my role but um it's working with operations people seeing how they can leverage technology more working with our finance teams to automate their processes um just really thinking about how we can stay ahead of the competition in this like increasingly technical space so i think it's like a yeah, it's, it's part like, uh, you know, part engineering, part inspiration, you know, part being the sort of the nerdy tech guy in the corner who can like say, hey, have you thought about doing it this way? So, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a balance, but um, but it's uh, it's great fun. It's a great role. With Florence, can you talk about what product you're building from a technology standpoint, just so that other users who aren't familiar uh, really understand what it is and what you're doing? Definitely. Yeah. So I mean, Florence kind of exists to like help solve some of the staffing challenges within healthcare. Like fundamentally, that sounds like a nice sort of strap line, but um, in reality, what that means is within the sort of healthcare sector, uh, staffing is a real like broken challenge, not just here in the UK, but also like you know, all around the world. Um, like you know, people are like, poorly paid, they're not very well you know, sort of managed, there's not much sort of development opportunities, and there's a lot of, um, I guess, use of sort of temporary staffing. So you know, not just sort of full-time staff, but people to kind of backfill here and there. Um, and particularly that part of the market is where we kind of focus on. So um, it's making sure that a healthcare facility, be it a hospital, be it a you know, care home, whatever it might be, they've got enough staff to kind of manage that. So um, the core of our product is this marketplace. Um, and you, you know, I've you know, spoken to people with other marketplace experience in the past, and it's a, we bring together you know, nurses, healthcare professionals on one side and care organizations, care organizations on the other. And the goal is basically making sure that you know, the care organizations can fill you know, all of their you know, shifts that they have available, you know, make sure that all of their patients have the care they need. And uh, on the other side, our care professionals, they get the best deal out of this. They can you know, choose their shifts. They have flexibility. They can manage, um, you know, manage their kind of like work-life balance. Um, yeah, so they're kind of helping both sides of that, uh, that problem space out. My brain immediately starts to like, oh, God, this has got to be an incredibly difficult problem. You know, you were with Florence through 2020, right? So you've seen a lot of change in this industry. I mean, you immediately had a stress test, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, um, yeah, I mean, I was I was two years in at that point, and uh, and obviously, yeah, COVID hit, and uh, the healthcare sector just turned upside down. And you know, for us working in the sort of temporary staffing space. Um, a lot of people in that sort of profession, they, they, they jump between different, you know, hospitals, different care organisations to kind of, you know, you know, fill the gaps. And suddenly we were told one day, nope, 
you're not allowed to do that. You, you, know, you can't move between different facilities. So, so our business model just entirely upended. Um, so I think, I mean, that was a you know, challenging time, but also kind of you know, fascinating in terms of thinking about how being agile, not just what you're doing technically and you know, delivering you know, new code and re-releases quickly, but being really responsive to your customers' needs, because that was like a really you know, fascinating time where you know, the, what, the, what the customers wanted changed overnight and continue to change every three weeks as a new government update or a new you know, policy or kind of you know, restriction came in place. So yeah, like, uh, that was a real sort of challenging time. But um, since then, it's obviously it's now back into you know, business as usual. But uh, I think you know, so much of the healthcare, healthcare sector is still you know, burnt by, you know, by, burnt by what happened and uh, it's still sort of feeling the, you know, the sort of the recovery you know, from, you know, from those couple of years. So, uh, yeah, but no, fasc- fascinating time. And I think like, we got through it through, yeah, like a lot of l- late nights and uh, a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of, uh, you yeah, sort of, um, uh, you yeah, know, working with it. But I think, yeah, staying close to the, the customers and making sure we were quick enough to respond to what they needed was how we sort of stayed ahead of the, the competition. Um, but, uh, yeah, a challenging time. Now, being behind the scenes, I, I think in operations, sometimes as things start to change, break, <laughs> stress, you start to see like cultural and societal things occurring behind the scenes. Was there anything that surprised you? I guess over the last, I don't so much has changed in the last couple of years, but you've really been at the heart of it. I mean, definitely. I mean, I think the big thing I've sort of realized is, I mean, a lot of what we've done is, is scaled. So, I mean, we're currently you know, handling you know, somewhere between the kind of it varies, but like sort of fifteen thousand healthcare professionals are like on our books, actively engaging, engaging with us, and that comes up from you know, when I first joined. Obviously, it was you know, you know in the sort of tens, we had a you know, Google spreadsheet running with you know, what was going on. We were sort of driving nurses to shifts, um, very very different sort of world, and that kind of like scaling thing was a real. That's been the real kind of like challenge of the company as we've sort of grown through that through that time over the last four or five years. And um, I think, yeah, my, my big challenge that kind of covers both of your questions, like what's what's good and what's bad, like, you know, uh, knowing when to automate and knowing when to actually, mm. you know, say, OK, we're going, we've got this problem, like we've, we can only hire so many people, you know, each week uh, to kind of grow. Uh, how, you know, how do we kind of like, you know, automate that? But equally, on the contrary, particularly you know, during sort of like, you know, more changing times like COVID, it's quite expensive to automate, you know, stuff. You've got to, you know, engineers aren't cheap. You've got to kind of like put a lot of time and energy and effort into getting it right. And, and I think a few times we made some mistakes where we over automated or we automated too soon before we really knew the problem. And I think that was, um, you know, that was uh, one of the most sort of, you know, like the interesting insights around like, you know, that, that kind of challenge over that kind of growth stage. Um, mm-hmm. But uh yeah, it's uh, being close with operations. I think I mean, you know, um, I think your listeners will probably understand this, but like you're having that kind of like connection between products engineering and uh, uh, and operations there, being really really close to what the real challenges are, and um, and pushing a little bit and yeah, you know, checking in on that before we actually commit to weeks and weeks of engineering time to try and like make something you know ten percent or twenty percent faster. So uh... even though it's very tempting to, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm learning a case study in my personal life. I'm trying to automate my habit tracking on my phone. <laughs> and so I was trying to do automations like open a timer when this app opens and like, guess what broke every single day this week, that automation. As a CTO, what are some tips in working with operational leaders that you'd like to give us, right? Like we're not perfect. We want to make sure that we're serving you and vice versa, that we're this tag team, this like salt and pepper, peanut butter and jelly. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think that the biggest thing is, you know, don't suffer in silence. And that sounds like a bit of a, a bit of a cliche, but um, I think, uh, you know, my experience of some of our operational teams in, in Florence, um, you know, they're all exceptional people. They work really, really hard. They're the, the kind of the, the core of the business. Um, and uh, and they're really good at finding fixes to problems and, uh, you know, sort of patching holes and so on. And um, uh, my big sort of like um, edict is always, you know, don't make another spreadsheet to solve that problem. I think that's like, a, that's such a problem that I think um, we sort of where uh, um, particularly when there's like a you know, technology team available to help out you know solve some problems and, and we've often found you know we've, we've introduced a bug somewhere in the system and uh, and the operational team have gone oh it stopped working I know I'll make a spreadsheet and I can track everything manually and uh, handle handle that side and uh, and it was a one line code change uh, to kind of you know, get it all working again but I think that thing around like yeah don't yeah don't suffer in silence like be acute to those kind of like challenges that's probably like um uh, yeah, tip number one. And I think like number two would probably be like engage 
um, with the engineers directly. Um, one of the things we do at Florence mm -hmm. is we get our engineering teams, our engineers themselves and our product managers, they go and spend some time sitting next to your operations teams, picking up calls from our customers, you know, handling those sort of tasks themselves. And I think that's a really interesting piece around an engineer will sit there and they'll do um, you know, a task that an operation, you know, operations like expert will be happily sort of doing uh, you know, day in, day out. And they'll go, I could automate that or I could make that sort of 10%, 10 percent better. And sometimes, obviously, you have to be careful with that. But um, but that kind of proximity, um, if it being in the same office or you're being to visit the teams or spend some time with them, that's really um, interesting because an engineer really is, you know, they're not you know, that sort of like, you know, impressive. They're just a really, really good problem solver. And I think that's another mm. thing that I think works really, really well when we get those, you know, we get our two teams sort of sitting together side by side, listening to calls and, and what have you. So, yeah, I think those two things are kind of the, the big ones. And that's where we've like um, seen the most success when we you know, sent an engineer to our, you know, one of our ops hubs and uh, they come back brimming with ideas and enthusiasm because they know how they can solve so many problems. And, and yeah, I think that's a, yeah, a really sort of key strength, I think, of the team. It's funny that you say that because I think about operations. Sometimes I find as an operator, we're the last ones to get fed. <laughs> so we're like band-aiding and taping shit together and like, I think this can last maybe a week. But if you have technical resources, the, the key is that you don't have to do that. Maybe, maybe if you talk to the technical team, it is something that you have to do, but it doesn't have to be the first line of defense of like tape it together. Like, you know, like that's not it. If you have the technical resource and the communication, which is established through those personal relationships that you were talking about, sitting in a room, talking about the problems that are on your day to day and seeing ways that you can solve it together. It's like um, opening your toolbox in, in a new sense. Definitely, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, that, you know, for an operations person, that kind of conversation, yeah, you've got to, you're fighting with a lot of other stuff, like, you know, product managers have got their roadmaps, they know everything they want to build from their user research and so on, and you're just like, you know, sort of sitting there quietly in the corner saying, oh, it would be really nice if you could, like, help us out over here. Um, but, uh, and I think, like, one of the things that's helped us there is, um, like, that, you know, um, I also run our sort of data function at Florence, and, you know, trying to bring a bit more of that sort of data mindset um, into, into operations has been really valuable, because, I've now had you know, a, a meeting where we've reviewed our roadmap and we've looked at you know, what we're coming. We've got some things on one side of like, oh, our customers are asking for this. And um, on the other side of operations, our, our VP of Ops has come in and said, oh, you know, we, uh, we think we could save you know, 40 hours a week of you know, uh, people, like hours, um, if you can make this small change here to the product. And everyone goes, wow, that's amazing. You know, forget what the users are saying. We're going to go and do that. And I think that's um, what, was, what makes that more interesting than just you know, sort of automation here or there is the data that comes behind that and the and the realization of the impact and um uh, and certainly I mean, within our sort of uh, our sort of space there's a lot of like um you know compliance work we're doing a lot of manual you know processing of documents and checking things and you know and what have you but um and a lot of that can you know there's it's ripe for automation or ripe for kind of like improving so yeah bringing the data to that sort of like picture is it's really yeah is really helpful and just adds some color to it because uh, uh sort of the second best thing for a ceo or a, a board of you know, directors to kind of look and say okay oh yeah we could really do that that's uh, that's gonna have a big impact for that team how when it comes to data i mean there are different levels of people knowing how to use data or analyze data to sort of present their issue or point. For people who are just learning how to do that, whether it's Google Sheets or whatever it may be, what are some things that you have found most effective in using data to make human decisions, right? Like, it's great that we have data, but how do we actually start to make decisions around those and, and prioritizing different changes we want to make? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that's, you know, the data challenge is a real big one. I mean, I think even if you've, all you've got is a spreadsheet and you've got basic sort of tools of adding up columns and that's sort of that's all you really need because most of what, um, you know, happens, and we've got a you know, great data team, they're doing really advanced modeling, but but at the end of the day, it's the storytelling. That's what you're kind of trying to get across as you're saying, I've got this sort of problem here and I'm trying to explain it, you know, um, often what's quite complicated, what's maybe I know a lot of context about. I know how many you know, clicks it takes to do this action or I know how many, you know, button presses it is over here to do this. Um, but telling that in a story and even adding things like names of like, oh, you know, you know John from my um, operations team is you know, having to do this a thousand times a day. Like, you know, poor John. <laughs> John. <laughs> Adding a bit of sort of storytelling to it and, and, um, and making people sort of like connect with it because um, particularly I think you know, for operations and the same thing true for finance teams and other teams um, that work I think, more in sort of like numbers and you know, efficiencies and that kind of thing rather than you know, maybe sort of sales where it's opportunities and excitement and marketing. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think keeping that sort of focus and, and saying, okay, well, let's, 
you know, let's try and tell a story with this. That gets the kind of point across and it allows it to kind of break through the, the noise that is all the requests and things that are coming into the business and all the kind of focuses we're, we're, you know, we're trying to like, yeah, work out what's our, our big one for the quarter or the, you know, the year, whatever. It's a great point too. And I think about myself, like what are boundaries that I find in presenting problems that I have? And a lot of the times I feel like I need to quantify a problem, right? This is costing us X amount of dollars or hours. But sometimes operational problems can't be quantified easily, or you create a whole other workload trying to quantify the problem that you know intuitively is there. Like time tracking, people always want to do time tracking. And I'm like, that is a can of worms like yes but do you think every human is going to press the start and stop button categorize like that's where there's push and pull yeah and a lot of it even i mean I, i'm a big fan of like envelope maths and uh this idea of like you know i don't know it doesn't i'm not going to sit there with a stopwatch and timing someone with every single phone call because also it's not realistic you're never going to get a true result from that um uh, and you know but but it gives you you know even if you just make up a, a number it doesn't really matter you're looking for sort of factors of 10 or 100 here really so if you say oh this thing takes 25 minutes it doesn't matter if it actually takes 15 or it doesn't matter if it actually takes 45 you know that that's still you know really really valuable in the kind of context of you know, putting it in in, in perspective um, and even without even without that information even if it's like you say that kind of gut instinct um, yeah if you can tell a story around it and, and and often the opportunity of what you know what could your team be doing if they weren't doing this thing uh, you, know, don't, you don't really even need to say oh this thing takes this much time it's just what what could they be doing if they weren't doing you know thing x and i think that's like that's often where we've sort of seen that um that growth i mean a lot of what we're doing at the minute is um you know trying to improve the speed at which we can get a nurse you know from signing up to to booking into a shift um and there's so much stuff in that kind of journey but the biggest thing we want to do is, is talk to them and you know, have a good conversation and give them the opportunities you know take them through the journey uh, and so on so more of the sort of you know the lower level things we can take away we can um, we can do that we don't need to know how many seconds it takes to uh, approve a first aid certificate or whatever it might be like it, it doesn't matter it's the the value is that time we're spending talking to them totally it's it's progress not perfection and that's just yeah, operators we tend to be perfectionists and it's not about that it's about can we move the dial forward just a little bit um now you and i met as technology educators and i i want our audience to understand that we worked closely. I had just been new to coding when I first joined the team and you were probably one of the most patient people I've ever worked with from a technical and a human standpoint. We were dealing with complex things that I had never dealt with before. I was incredibly overwhelmed. I honestly don't even know if you know this, but I was always nervous because I was like, oh, Tom really, he really knows his stuff. Like I need to come in. I need to know this. And you made such a safe space for me to learn, to ask questions, and most importantly, to fail in. Like I fell on my face a lot and you never ever judged me for it. And you always supported me and, and taught me the next thing that I needed to know. And I think that's such a strength that you have. Where, where does this come from? Where did you learn it? How do you instill it in your team? Because I do think that's part of what makes you unique as a technologist. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think I mean for me, it's the it's the kind of empathetic part, right? And yeah, one of our one of Florence's values is put yourself in their shoes. And yeah, I think like I that's almost one of my favorite ones because um, I think that's one of the things you have to do in technology because what often what you're doing, what you're bringing to the table, is a very unique sort of skill set. And um, and you know you could be sort of really you know sitting you know, high and mighty and you know uh, in that kind of situation. But um, what I find is useful is that yeah that realizing that you know people are a little bit you know a little bit scared. Yeah, you know, they're they're not really sure what like the opportunities are. And um, and I think yeah like uh, talking them through you know through that and sort of sitting down with them. And I think like you know that's one of the things that um, I'd encourage other CTOs to kind of think about doing is you know, you know don't just sit yourself with the engineers. Go and spend some time with it with other teams. And uh, I often find this. I go into our operations hubs and it goes oh the CTOs here the CTOs here. <laughs> but um, uh, and, oh my god, oh my god! And, uh, and by the end of it, we're yeah, we're laughing and we're joking and we're sharing donuts and we're talking about what we're doing. And I think, and and yeah, sort of trying to be a little bit vulnerable sometimes. And and uh, yeah, I think we're also quite open at, at Florence about any bugs and the issues we've had. And we hold these big public post mortems. And, and I think that kind of helps you know make people realise that the engineers aren't always right, and um, because we hardly ever are. And uh, I think it's that kind of you know that balance of making people feel like you're approachable, making sure that you can um, you balance that out. And I guess 
just for other people. You know, it's hard sometimes, like cracking that nut and 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 getting through to um, you know, to some engineers and to some like you know, technologists. But uh, um, but yeah, sort of persist because I think that uh, you, know, you know, show them part of your world because they'll be fascinated by it. You know, they you know, we're all we're all uh, massive problem solvers, as I said, and it's you know that that sort of uh, you know, is a good sort of way in. Like show them show them the problem that you've got, um, and they'll be friends for life. And I think that's like a real um, yeah, a real sort of valuable point. But, it's true. And vice versa, too. I mean, for an operator, you know, like we talked about earlier, it's all about communicating and making those relationships to say, hey, Tom, I have this problem. I don't really know how to solve it, but it's just stupid. I, I know we could do it better. And putting your head together and figuring it out, again, you're expanding what you are able to do then at that point, because you're not just working with yourself or your ops people, but your technical people as well, and, and more and more from there. Now, um, as a technologist, the amount that you are having to learn and keep up with blows my mind. I am exhausted and I'm not even coding on a daily basis or having to make decisions as a CTO. How are you learning, um, updating, <laughs> maintaining a code base, pushing, like, how are you doing all of these things and where does learning fit into that equation? That's a really good question. I mean, yeah, for me, I mean, yeah, being coming from a sort of technology education background, like learning is such a key part of yeah you know, what we do as an engineer. And it doesn't just stop once you've finished your you know degree or you finish your boot camp or whatever it is, and you're you're, you're ready to go. Like it, it does, it's a lifelong experience because, as you say, it's such a fast moving industry. Um, I mean, I give you an example. Like at Florence, we have like a Learning Friday, we call it. Uh, it's not every Friday, but it's once a month, and it's that kind of yeah you know, focus. And I'm sure other teams do sort of similar sort of similar sort of things, but really sort of pushing that uh, like sort of creative. Um, you know, learning you know environment and uh, some of our engineers will come in on that day and they might be you know learning an entirely new programming language that's kind of like new and fresh or they might be you know trying out something they kind of thought about during the week might be interesting or maybe they spoke to the ops team and they said oh I'm going to have a go at solving that problem um, and that kind of like trying to build that kind of culture of learning within a team I, I find is like really really valuable um, I guess the second thing is um, is like hackathons. I'm like a big, big uh, you know, fan of hackathons. And if you don't know what one, one is, it's like this sort of you know period of time, whatever it is, 24 hours, 48 hours, two days, where you know you are the rule book gets thrown out the window. There's no you know check with the C-suite before you launch a feature. It's just let's go full creative and see what we can build. And um, and that's a brilliant sort of space for learning as well. And and we often do uh, our hackathons are joint with other teams, so we might have the marketing team in or some people from operations in, um, and bringing those ideas together and everyone goes wow oh, I didn't know we could do this in such a short <laughs> space of time it's, it's incredible um but um during that process like as an engineer you learn so much um and I'm sure you know if other teams did that if you did a, run a hackathon for maybe one of your operational processes and you know like, let's throw the rule back out the window let's see how we could like you know, uh, you know reinvent this um you know it kind of encourages people to try something new and that's really what learning is right you know, you're you're trying new things mm -hmm. you're picking up knowledge from that so yeah I think that's uh that's the, you know, those two things are the real keys, like enough time for learning and uh, yeah, enough time for creativity as well. Mm, both things that are, I love. Uh, last question for you before we do a little uh, wrap up about you, which is um, when it comes to being an engineer versus a CTO, transition into that <laughs> skill set. And I'm sure there are a ton of people who are either engineers that are listening or who have just started out in their career. And as you've made that journey in yourself, what is a tip that you would give to others if they want to go in that same path? What is something that you had to learn the hard way that maybe you could make a little bit easier for them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think so. Obviously, there's an element of like management, yeah, that kind of comes in with it. But um, for me, I've definitely taken that from more of a coaching approach. Like, how do you, yeah, you know, sort of build and develop the team? And if you're, uh, you know, someone who's uh, maybe even with no technical experience, but you're a really good sort of people person, and you can like help people develop and you know push them further forward. Like, you make a great CTO because that's really most of what it is. Um, and I guess the other half is really, you know, you've got to know because, as I mentioned, you know, earlier, you've got this like. Uh, uh, you've got to be a little bit in every single part of the puzzle um, and like offering sort of support there. So you've got to be a pretty good, you know, operations person. You've got to be you know, good enough at your sort of numbers for finance. You've got to know what a marketing campaign looks like and how it works. And I think that's kind of, yeah, that's the other kind of you know, strength. So, um, and I see so many great CTOs who have moved from other, you know, other sort of fields and moved into this, you know, from product or from marketing or other, other areas. And um, they bring with them that kind of like skill set of just, you know, I'm, I'm a great sort of people person. Uh, maybe I've done a boot camp where I know how to code, but it's really about like developing people and um, yeah, like asking more questions about uh, technology. How can you keep pushing things forward? Um, so yeah, those mm -hmm. those two things. Yeah, 
it all comes down to humanity and being humans and, and learning how to be together, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, all right, let's wrap up uh, with some rapid fire questions to learn about you, Tom, as the human being. So I'm gonna shoot you these questions, come up with the, the first thing that is on the top of your head and let us know what you think. So first question is, what is the favorite part of your day? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned kind of coaching there. Like, I think you know, uh, a, you know, fantastic one to one uh, with a, with a team member where you're like, uh, you know, you're really sort of like working through a problem that they've got. You know, maybe it's like they're you know they're like you know, had a really bad day of meeting with someone from operations or from marketing, and you've like talked them through that, and, and they come away going, yeah, okay, great, I've got it. I'm, I'm sort of running. Like that's a, always a great feeling, right? You know, you're sort of pushing that that way forward. So um, yeah, but um, yeah, my. I normally have them in the morning and the and the evening, so top and tail of the day, and uh, it's a great start and a great finish to the day to do something like that. Yeah, being the ultimate hype man. Uh, <laughs> what is something that makes you little kid happy outside of work? Oh, outside of work, um, it's a good question. So I do a lot of DIY and a lot of like uh, um, woodworking on the side. So you know, like a uh, yeah, really nice sort of uh, yeah, bit of furniture, or um, I've just made a, some banquet seating uh, for for my living room. So, what? Um, so that's like a nice little yeah way to kind of get away from the keyboard, from the computer screen, and yeah, like do something with my hands. So it's uh yeah, it's uh that's my sort of yeah secret joy, I guess. Yeah. What is the best purchase you've made under fifty dollars? I'd probably say like uh, I've got a little like um yeah, kind of MagSafe thing to like hold my phone, um, and I stick it on the wall yes. so it's away from my bed. So I've got like a nice sort of space, quiet, calm before mm. uh, before bedtime. So I'd recommend that. Like charge it, stick it away from the bed. That's a great hack. I'm going to do that. That is a great hack. Um, not not only answered a question, but gave us a hack. Um, last one is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like longer term, I think yeah. What I really enjoy about this this role is like sort of helping you know engineers and other people sort of develop and that kind of coaching side of things. So I can, you know, maybe one day when I've got a little bit more experience and um you know I'm uh, um you know sort of like reclining in my armchair. Um, you know, it might be sort of being a coach or a therapist, as I like to call it, for like, uh, you know, for, for other people within products, technology, engineering, like that kind of stuff. I think that'd be like, you know, that'd be a great role and uh, a yeah, nice, nice way to sort of start my retirement, really. Uh, technology therapist. I totally see a whole new industry there. Just saying. Uh, Tom, always a pleasure. So grateful to you for all that you've helped steer me in my own career journey, but also for chatting with us today about the role of the CTO and everything that you're doing. We really appreciate it. Uh, Secret Ops listeners, thank you so much for listening. You can follow us on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts, and we will see you next time. Bye.